Hello and welcome to Global Eye. I'm Parikshit Lutra. What to expect from the union budget is perhaps the most buzzing question around investment circles in India and among its partners. The US-India Strategic Partnership Forum has some key asks from the finance minister and these include promoting digital payments, reforms in healthcare and insurance segments and lastly simplifying foreign investments. The Centre for Strategic and International Studies recommends expediting settlement of contractual disputes, reducing import tariffs and improving infrastructure for MSMEs for ease of doing business with India. As the budget countdown begins, the curiosity is only increasing about what the budget has in store. To talk more about the expectations, we're joined by Mukesh Aghi, President and CEO of the US-India Strategic Partnership Forum and Anit Mukherjee, adjunct fellow at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Mukesh Aghi, uh, what would be your top ask from the Indian government when it comes to the budget? What are US investors, businesses looking for? Appreciate the good to be on your show. Uh, it's important to understand India is the chair of the G20. India is the fastest growing economy in the world today. And there is a global disruption in supply chain. That means it's an opportunity for India to target at least $100 billion FDI this year itself. That means we need to have a budget which is much more focused on capital investment, on infrastructure investment, uh, trying to improve supply chain so you're able to get more PLI incentive going uh, for better manufacturing job creation. So what we're looking for is a budget which is focused on growth for the next 10 years. If you want this economy to be a $5 trillion economy or $10 trillion economy, this is the year to set up that pace, momentum, and, and drive that growth in the economy itself. Right. Anit, uh, to get you in, CSIS has been doing a lot of analysis on what the budget needs to be uh, needs to be doing. We've seen manufacturing share in the GDP falling. Uh, even Rick Rosso from CSIS has pointed out that uh, Make in India has made little progress over the years when it comes to India as a manufacturing destination. What can the budget do? How important is this opportunity to bring reforms to attract China plus investments? Uh, Preksha, thank you for having me. Um, I think looking at the global picture, I think India is a, is, is a beacon of stability in a pretty difficult world, let's put it that way. Um, and therefore, I think for global investors, the most important thing is that this budget signals and consolidates that stability. Um, I would be very uh, concerned if this is a, a, a really populist budget and we are not uh, we are not keeping track of on fiscal consolidation and that has uh, global implications as well. Um, we need stability in the taxation and the uh, the investment regime, and I think in a way the, the 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 growth story of India being such an outlier in the global. Uh, economy makes it an attractive destination in any case. Having said that, you uh, we mentioned uh, infrastructure for MSMEs. Yes, with the PLI, PLI scheme mm. try, uh, getting some kind of traction, we need to really focus on the, the enabling infrastructure, which also includes digital payments and things like that. So for me, the ask is keep the macro fiscal condition stable and uh, healthy. And at the same time, try to make sure that when, what are the enabling infrastructure and tariffs and the other uh, non-tariff barriers that, uh, that can enable the Indian man, in India to attract the China Plus mm. investment. Having, I mean, just, just one quick uh, point on the China Plus one. Um, there's a lot of talk on, on this. And I think, I think we need to understand also that it is in China's interest to move some of this manufacturing abroad. China has, uh, this is the first year that they've officially declared mm -hmm. that their, their uh, population is falling. So there is a demo huge demographic transition happening mm -hmm. within China and mass manufacturing would be the first thing that probably they would like to move offshore. So there is, there is a confluence of a lot of global factors in play here. Right. Uh, Mr. Agi, coming to you, when it comes to tax parity, when it comes to transparency in the tax regime, are there any kind of tax concessions or tax cuts that you're seeking for uh, U.S. businesses? 
Yes, uh, you know, we are saying that uh, have tax parity. For example, the multinational banks are charged much higher tax than the local banks itself. You know, basically have a parity there. Have more uh, sense of dispute resolution because what, what's happening is, yes, government needs to extract as much as tax they can, but at the same time, there has to be a transparent process on dispute resolution. Almost every American company has some kind of a, a challenge on the tax uh, authorities itself. So we need to have a mechanism to sort those out in a very immediate fashion. So I think we, our ask is to bring it, make it more rationalize the tax system, make the dispute uh, resolution much smoother and faster itself, and, and make sure that there's a transparency as you start making different changes in the policy that there's a consultative process there. Hmm. Uh, Anit, you've written about the need for an agriculture PLI scheme. Why is that important? And uh, do you think that is doable uh, in a year, in a year which is actually an election year? And there will po po possibly be a lot of focus on populism. Um, excellent question, Parikshit. Um, I think if we look at the three big crises, the poly crisis, as they call it, the food, fuel, fiscal, I think I have addressed the fiscal one in the first uh, question. Um, India's food security depends, and I would say a lot of global food security depends on how agriculture in India performs. Um, and for a long time, we have, but we have we've done a lot of input-based um, incentives for agriculture. And as I've written in, in the piece, um, about 75% of the uh, farmer-related um, uh, incentives go for PDS and fertilizer subsidy. Now, we need to move from the production to productivity. And that is the key to ensuring long-term food security. Now, yes, there are huge challenges of how do we manage the, the data, how do we even measure what productivity is in agriculture, but it can be done um, with a lot of digitization that has happened in land records, with even our fertilizer subsidy being moved to cash transfers. I think you, we, there is a huge moment here that we can really push for a for a for a strategic view on how we improve productivity. It, it is also a difficult year, as you said, but some of the more um, how would I call it? The, the imaginative solutions uh, come in a in a last year of a, of a political cycle budget. Hmm. Right, uh, Mr. Agi, coming back to you. When it comes to ease of doing business reforms, uh, are there certain measures that you hope the government would consider that you may have sent in your presentation to the finance minister? Yes, I think it's important that uh, the companies coming in, investing in the country and creating jobs, uh, they are able, they benchmark uh, with the global standards. And I think there is a tremendous amount of improvement we can bring in in the ease of doing business. For example, when you are able to try to allocate land or try to get electricity permit, the permit process is so long and tedious that it makes it difficult for a lot of companies to set up manufacturing in India. Yes, there is improvement. If when you compare five years from ago or last year itself, we are moving in the right direction. A simple example in global supply chain, as we attract China plus one strategy into India, uh, components are made and they go in and out different geographies and different borders. It is important that we are able to have them move much more efficiently. Studies have shown that when you manufacture in India, the, one of the bigger costs is logistics. Almost 20% when you compare to China, higher in India. We need to look at how we are able to make the ease of doing business easier, better, so you compete on a global basis. There is a lot of improvement, but there's a lot of way to go to improve much further to have benchmark on a global basis. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Agi and uh, Anit Mukherjee, for joining us here on this program, giving us your view on uh, what the budget could have in store for foreign investors and what global companies are looking at as well. Thanks once again for joining us. We're going to take a short break here on the program. Don't go anywhere. Lots more coming up on Global Eye.
Welcome back. You're still with us on Global Eye. As we get closer to the union budget, we're discussing the world's expectations from India as an investment destination. Remember, this will also be a challenging year. The global slowdown will have an impact on India's exports. Challenge Tackling inflation is going to be a challenge as well. And uh, what will be the growth considering all these headwinds? Joining us now to talk about this all is Arvind Panagaria, former vice chairman of the Niti Aayog. Mr. Panagaria, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, give us a sense of what global investors, multinationals, would be looking at as far as budget 2023 is concerned. Or do you feel that this budget will be very high on populism? Well, uh, you know, as far as the global investors are concerned, uh, those who know India also know that, you know, this is the last full budget that the government will be presenting before uh, the 2024 elections. So they do understand that some bit of populism will be there. Uh, 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 but they also know that, you know, the present government uh, uh, follows a different kind of populism. You know, it, it, it generally... Uh, uh, goes for schemes uh, in which delivery to the beneficiaries is uh, 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 highly productive. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, mm. from that perspective, I would say uh, the expectations can't be currently high, at least for the investors who know India well. Um, this being said, you know, mm. uh, uh, some bit of uh, fiscal consolidation they will be looking for because, you know, uh, the debt to GDP ratio has gone up to 84%. Uh, and other good features also they'll be looking for things like, you know, uh, larger capital expenditure, building up infrastructure, uh, uh, and some announcements on uh, uh, continuing uh, uh, ease of doing business uh, reforms. Uh, 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 there are other areas of reforms mm -hmm. which uh, uh, may not directly impact the investors, but nevertheless, you know, uh, uh, to the extent that that provides a signal uh, as to what direction the government is uh, taking, uh, uh, any announcements of reforms will probably be of interest to them as well. Right. Now, we have been hearing over the last few months how the government is changing its stance on Chinese investments. They want to have Chinese JVs with Indian companies in areas which are strategically important for us, where we do not have strength in intermediary product manufacturing. Uh, we are wooing suppliers of Apple to come and make uh, uh, iPads in India as well. So how do you think India should approach the China plus one strategy? We see a lot of investments going to Vietnam. How important is this budget from the point of view of seizing Chinese plus one investments? I think that's an ongoing agenda. Uh, and, and this is really a great opportunity for India. Uh, to uh, capitalize on uh, the, the uh, changed environment in which uh, virtually all multinationals are seeking at least one more destination, what you've just mentioned as China plus one. Uh, so uh, uh, from that perspective, mm. we have to continue uh, uh, to uh, uh, generally open up the economy. Uh, 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 and, and particularly, I think, you know, the progress on the, the free trade agreements from that perspective is extremely important. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, mm. multinationals come not just for the domestic market. I think domestic market is important for them. But uh, uh, ultimately, they are large exporters. Mm. Uh, they are uh, uh, very much uh, mm. uh, plugged into the global economy. Uh, and uh, our own, India's own interest mm. also is in having multinationals precisely from that perspective that, you know, India becomes the uh, manufacturing hub and becomes mm. the, uh, the, the uh, key exporter of many of these manufacturing products. So uh, 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 I think the free trade agreements and in general trade liberalization, because you see the, the whole point is that uh, not everything is produced in the same country of location. Uh, and a lot of the components in, uh, and, and, mm. and increasingly so in the last 15 to 20 years, components are imported from elsewhere. And mm. if the duties are high, uh, mm. uh, then of course the costs add up. So we also need uh, uh, liberalizing uh, our trade uh, uh, to become this kind of, you know, hub of the supply chains, alternative supply chains that will be forming in the next five to 10 years. Right. I would also like to ask you about manufacturing. 
while India has brought in several PLI schemes for at least 14 sectors to encourage manufacturing, encourage localization, encourage exports, we've seen the manufacturing share in the GDP uh, drop. Uh, to what extent do you feel the Make in India program has been a success? What more needs to be done to make India a leader in uh, manufacturing and be a bigger contributor in global supply chains? Yeah, no, I, I think that is really the crux of the matter. Uh, and, and what we have tried to do is, you know, use, broadly speaking, an import substitution strategy, both through increased uh, protection mm -hmm. uh, and through PLI. I think, you know, even the PLI seems to be more concentrated in sectors uh, where, uh, uh, in effect, uh, uh, we are importers of the products, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, products in which uh, we are larger exporters uh, uh, are not generally the targets of this PLI scheme. So uh, the, the, the difficulty there, of course, is that, you know, uh, through import substitution, you cannot grow manufacturing on, on a very large scale. Ultimately, you have to look to the global marketplace. Mm -hmm. And that is why you have to be into the export industry. And that actually calls for completely the reverse strategy. Uh, 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 of, because, you know, remember that both import substitution as well as PLI, uh, uh, to the extent that PLI is aimed at more of the import competing sectors, they put the remaining sectors at disadvantage. Because, you know, uh, when so many sectors get protected, mm -hmm. then if you are unprotected, then you are basically being disprotected. Likewise, if you, you know, incentives are given in certain mm -hmm. sectors and, you know, significantly large number of sectors, then mm -hmm. if you are not getting the incentive, then you are disin disincentivized. So there is a negative impact on the rest of the sectors, mm -hmm. and these are the export sectors. And, uh, and ultimately, remember that the many, you know, any country which has successfully kind of built up manufacturing, uh, which has successfully grown at 8 to 10%, they have done it on the back of uh, 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 being a part of the global economy, being major exporters, uh, and uh, having uh, hosts to very large companies. You know, if the if you got a set of large companies uh, uh, plugged into the export markets, then the medium-sized domestic companies also do well. Uh, even the smaller ones do very well, actually. You know, once uh, once mm. the, the ecosystem comes to be defined by the uh, dominant export firms, then then domestic entire ecosystem actually gears up mm. to that. That is the strategy ultimately in the longer run we need. Mm. Mm. Right. Uh, Mr. Panagaria, also when it comes to asset monetization, divestment, uh, do you need, do you feel that the budget should perhaps uh, somehow give a roadmap? We need to see some speeding up of projects when, uh, which we have planned for under asset monetization, divestment. Uh, the reason why I'm asking is because today we have reported how the government could somehow dedicate this budget to the middle class. There could be changes in the tax regime to put more income ha in the hands of the middle class. For example, a new tax lab in the 10 lakh category could be introduced and the tax rate could be brought down from 20% to 10%. So several uh, measures like this to give more spending power to the middle class could be there in the budget. So what do you think about other measures that uh, foreign companies, foreign investors would be looking out for? Yeah. So most certainly, you know, you mentioned uh, 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 monetization of assets, but also there is the issues of privatization of public sector enterprises, privatization of public sector banks. So all that privatization agenda in which I will include the monetization of assets uh, uh, has to move forward. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 it is politically a little challenging for the governments to actually put out a timetable. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, uh, the the agenda can be accelerated, uh, and 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 uh, the government could at least, you know, make an announcement that it's committed to carrying out the privatization process and monetization of assets process. Uh, uh, that would be a good signal. Uh, so that's one thing it can do. Uh, on taxation, of course, you know, personal income taxation uh, has been waiting uh, uh, to see the reforms. Uh, this, uh, th there was an alternative slab for taxes uh, 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 in 2020-21 budget that had been introduced. Uh, and, and that, you know, was the alternative schedule that taxpayers could use, provided they did not uh, resort to any of the exemptions. But those tax rates remain relatively high, so there have not been many takers. 
uh, I think this is a good time. Mm -hmm. I've been arguing about mm -hmm. this uh, uh, in other forums as well, that this is a good time now to actually uh, uh, carry forward that reform, bring those tax rates down, uh, uh, mm. uh, uh, and 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 mm. encourage people to shift to exemption free schedule, so that eventually, you know, in two to three years, mm. we can eliminate the current mm. uh, uh, the exemption uh, uh, raj, as I call it. You know that that whole regime ought to ultimately go away, mm. uh, and 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 I think uh, uh, that that will, you know, one for for one thing, the principle wise, you know, the good economic principle is one of what we call the horizontal equity, meaning that you know, equal income should be taxed at equal rates. Mm. The, the taxation should not depend on how I spend mm. my income or how I earn my income. You know, If I have certain mm. income uh, and you have mm. a certain income, uh, we should be subject to the same taxation. But the current system is not like that. So horizontal equity is mm. required, both from an efficiency point right. of view as well as from an equity point of view. Uh, and, and that can be achieved only when you get rid of the exemptions uh, uh, that also brings in simplification. You know, taxpayers uh, then don't have to run to the to, uh, to the uh, uh, okay. uh, to, to the chartered accountants and all. You know, don't have to pay such high fees to them. So, uh, for all that reasons, you know, and, and it, as you said, it will also put more purchasing power in the hands of uh, uh, right. the taxpayers. Okay, we've run out of time, but uh, Mr. Panagaria, thank you so much for joining us here on Global Eye, giving us a sense of what India can do to become a bigger player in global manufacturing, global value chains, and also attract a large chunk of China plus one investments. Uh, it was a pleasure having you here on Global Eye. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.